Hello, everybody. I see still people coming in. Uh, welcome on this session on how to build a customer data platform on Google Cloud. Uh, please grab a seat. There are also some seats in front. OK, let's get started already, because uh, somebody told me we're on a tight schedule. So it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Rick Powells. I'm a senior data architect here at Devil Team G Cloud. Um, so I spend most of my time building data ingestion pipelines making data warehouses, and also doing data visualization with various tools. Uh, and if you want to stay connected, here is my LinkedIn uh, link, so uh, please uh, reach out. OK, so what's on the agenda today for this session? It's how to build a customer data platform. So we're going to talk first, what is a customer data platform? Then I show one reference case that we've done, um, and then our approach, what we learned throughout the years uh, with building these platforms. OK. so. On customer data platform, there are a lot of definitions. So I had to pick one of them, and this is the definition I like most. It's a bit of an old one. It's from 2016. Uh, and yes, that's old in IT, of course. Um, it's from the Customer Data Platform Institute. And they tell, you, they tell you, OK, a customer data platform is a package software, that's important, that creates a persistent, unified customer database that's accessible to other systems. So three important things here. First, it's a package software. It does this. Nothing else, it works, and you get all your data in. Second, it's persistent and unified. So that means it will track your information over time. Um, so if something changes yes yesterday to today, you can see that change in that platform. And it's unified, so it doesn't matter where your data is generated. All your data comes in your one place, and it gets treated in the same way for your end users. And third, most important thing, it's, it's accessible to other systems. If you cannot activate your data, then you can just hoard all your data. You're not doing anything with it. You're not getting value from it. So we go with this definition for now. Okay. So now that we know what it is, why should you want it? Why do you need it in your business? It's because customers have to come ex uh, to expect personalized experiences. And if I can get a personalized experience in uh, your company and not in your competitors, I will choose your company. Because I have to spend less time digging around um, and I have to just less stress overall to finding what I need. So um, I showed here three, um, three uh, investigations. Uh, on this topic. So the first one is successful personalization uh, and improved customer experience can increase customer satisfaction by 20%. I mean, this is a no-brainer. Your customers do not spend time on searching what they want. They just get it presented in front of them. So no time lost, customers are uh, satisfied. Then second one, 67% of, consu uh, of consumers are interested in a customer support experience. Just we all have the same 24 hours a day. If I have to spend 30 minutes on your platform digging around, I don't want that. I want you to present me with what I like. Um, so this is also a no-brainer. The third one is a bit different. Delivering relevant experiences to customer can decrease cost by 30% and increase revenue. OK, the increased revenue, we all see that one. But also the decreased cost, that's something I was very interested in. But it does make sense if you think about it. Because if I can find what I want on your platform, I don't have to bother your customer support. I don't have to bother sending emails. And you can spend time on actually doing relevant work instead of answering my specific one question. That doesn't bring a lot of value for you. Um, so yeah, it can also decrease the cost of your entire company. OK, so we, um, um, we have a lot of data. Um, and I'm now going to say what data is important. That is your first party data. First party data is very fun, uh, fundamental is the foundation of your, um, your personalized experience. What is first party data? That's data that you get from your own IT stack, from your own platforms. This is data generated by your product, by the consumers of your product. Um, and because you are in the lead of um, the creation of the data, the transformations and all the things um, after that, you can make it as qualitative as possible. You are in control of the completeness, the reliability, the integrity. So this data is very powerful. And most importantly, it's unique. Your competitors don't have that information. You can spot trends on that data that you generated, and your competitors cannot. They cannot buy it. They cannot buy a license like third-party data. You have the data, so you're one step uh, ahead of your competitors. So now, how can Google uh, help you by uh, getting this data? Well, Google can help you, and that's the nice thing. It can help you from start to finish. So start, we start with collecting and transforming data 
from your platform, uh, from somewhere else, uh, and to get it in your domain on Google Cloud. Second is to analyze the data and visualize the data. See where your trends are, understand your data. Third is to activate the data. Very important um, to act on the data that you see. Don't just let it there because it's fun to work with data. No, you have to act on the data. It's better to activate 10% of your data than store 100% and don't do anything with it. So to collect and transform, um, there is a whole suite of products in Google uh, that help you with it. We have Analytics 360. Most of you are already familiar with that one. But also Google Ads, YouTube Ads, and Firebase make it very easy to port data from your application to GCP. Um, and then it is in GCP, the Google Cloud, um, for example, in BigQuery, which is a database. Um, and from there, you can connect various tools to investigate your data and see what the trends, see what your data means, and try to understand what your customers are doing. This is something you can do, for example, with Data Studio, with Looker, um, to understand and make dashboards. And then you can try to predict outcomes from it with, for example, the Vert Vertex AI suite. And what is very nice is all these pieces, they fit together like a puzzle. So what I will be going in this, uh, in this talk is spend your time on seeing where you want to go and don't spend your time on clicking all the technology together and making everything work because you just press five buttons and you have the whole pipeline set up. Okay, so next one is activating the data. And how you can activate data is, for example, by, um, by customized personalized content on your application or, for example, by targeting ads to specific users that are on the verge of buying something but just need that extra one push. Um, or, for example, also email programs. And this is also something that can be set up automatically uh, with the Google um, products. So what we saw um, in uh, a couple of years ago was um, this, this system. So if we think about the definition uh, before, it was one package software that handles all your customer data. So we have there the customer data platform. But then companies were very amazed with, okay, we now have all the data of customers, but we don't have the data from uh, all other things, our products, our orders, whatever. All this data cannot fit in the customer data platform they built because they didn't think of it uh, before. So then they started to make data warehouses or data lakes. And then you have like, kind of an awkward uh, situation where there is data in there, there is data in here. Now you want to do analytics. Now you want to serve content from both of them. Where are you going to get the data? It's again siloed, but now it's just siloed in a different way. So what we see now is more and more um, companies are transitioning to this system, where there is no dedicated customer um, data platform anymore. Maybe they start from it, but then it becomes just a data platform. Where there is customer data, it gets streamed in, gets batch loaded in, but there's also other data. There's room for other data, for example, for your orders, or your suppliers. So we went from having two systems to only one, but it serves the same goal. You want to get all your data in, you want to visualize it, and this gets more, um, more easy because all the tools uh, will seemingly connect to, for example, BigQuery or to other databases on Google Cloud. And then you take your data and you can even port it back to your source systems with reverse ETL. Um, so your data quality in your source systems will also increase. So everybody can act with clean data and also with complete data, which makes it much easier for everybody. Okay, so now one slide a bit more technical uh, on some names uh, that you can investigate. And I promise you, you won't lose time on investigating those. Um, so first, we have the data sources. The logo below is the, um, the marketing platform of Google. So you have to work with whatever source you have. It's very hard to migrate sources. Um, it is doable, but most of the time we just work with the sources there are. Okay. Then we have first layer, the ingestion. Those are the tools that take your data from the source and pump it, for example, into BigQuery. Why I'm always talking about BigQuery? Well, because it scales with your needs and you can very easily try something out with it. You pay for what you use, so if your data is just laying there, you pay very little uh, amount. So we port it in, either with a, um, with a managed solution like Fivetran or with Stitch, or even open source solutions uh, like Airbytes that you can host yourself if you want that full uh, level of control. Okay, then your data is in BigQuery, but your data is very structured um, and very hard 
uh, maybe compressed even in a table that's very specific to your source. If we're ingesting Oracle, it will most of the time be a star schema, a snowflake schema, whatever. If it's, um, if it's um, ads from, from Google or marketing data, the data is this one big table with a lot of nesting fields. And everybody that has seen that data is sometimes hard to work with uh, if it's in that, in that structure. So we have here, next layer, the transformation. We take the structures from the source, we break it down, and then we're trying to build it up again here. We're going to say, why do we need it? Well, it's very easy. If somebody is working in Looker and it's working on client data, it doesn't, it doesn't want to know or she doesn't want to know where the data came from. Just want one inter interface, one table with all the client information. So she does not need to care about, oh, it's coming from Oracle, so I need to do this star schema, this snowflake schema, or it's coming from SAP. No, we break it down, one universal data uh, mart or one universal table, and then we connect that one universal table to all the other tools, or we even port it back with reverse ETL, uh, which you can see here on below. So for transformation, uh, we see a lot of people using Dataform, our internal uh, framework Flix, uh, or DBT. Um, and then, yeah, we have the Vertex AI up top um, to try to predict and get insights from your data. Then we have the BI tools and the reverse ETL tools. And that's um, the reverse ETL is something we see a lot now happening. Uh, which we have a lot of data, but our source systems are still dirty. The data there is still dirty. Okay, let's try to fix it. Port the clean data back um, so people can work with clean data everywhere. Okay, so now it's time for uh, um, a bit of a general case for RBFA um, that I would like to present. So RBFA is the Royal Belgian Football Association. Um, so they are in charge for the Red Devils and the whole uh, circus around it. Um, and they came to us in 2017. We have a lot of data and we have a lot of in people interested in the data. Please help us in guiding, um, making one data lake to port the data back to the people that want it. So they have data, they have public data like the weather, everybody has the data, um, but they also have data coming from their social media. How happy are people with uh, certain uh, matches? How happy are they with the customer support? Uh, those kind of things. Then they have data coming from their app. Um, and from just the internal workings, okay, who is playing um, how much soccer, who is a referee, who is just uh, there as a supporter, which uh, teams are there supporting, um, and then also data coming from partners. And this is kind of the obvious way to go. Try to make your users of your app, um, try to give them a personalized experience, but they also want to give insight to the partners because for them it's very important. That's where all the money comes from. So you want to keep your partners happy. Show them what their um, money brings to them back. Show them what the value is that they spend um, on, the, on your product. So we uh, got to work, or my colleagues got to work, uh, and first made the vision. Very important to focus on that. Then they built the data lake, uh, then got insights from that data lake where all the data was um, was uh, together um, to make smart services. And then also, fifth step, monetize the data. If you have data that's valuable for a lot of people, you can also monetize it yourself. You can say, look, I have this table with data. You can buy it from me or you can use it from me. You can buy a license um, to just let other people activate it, but you're getting, um, you're getting revenue from it. So um, after uh, some, uh, some iterations, they came with the customer 360 view. So as you can see, there is a lot of data going there. Um, so how many uh, games that the player um, played over the years, um, what's his date of birth, gender, all those things, um, which the customer or the user gave consent to, of course. You don't want to track all the information where there is no consent to, uh, because then legally it's a bit different uh, and a bit harder. So then we ha you have all the information, then now you can start to use it. So now there is an omni-channel, there is an app um, and a website which is fed by this data. Uh, they're now building also a loyalty platform. Um, so to keep your users interested in your app, keep them coming back. That's a very nice thing of loyalty pro uh, platform. So if they interact a lot with the app or they interact just a lot with Belgian football in total, then um, they get rewarded maybe for discounts or for a soccer ball or, um, or a t-shirt. Um, so what did we learn over the years? That is, 
don't try to focus too much on the technology in the first place. Let Google help you. Um, let Google help you in clicking all the pieces together, but don't start with it because it's very easy to just dig a hole for yourself and just going in that hole further and further, and then at the end you don't have business value. So first, start on your personas. Who is using your product? Um, and write them out. Maybe not as elaborate as this example, because you also spend time on this, on this of course, but give them a face. Just generate a, a random face on the internet, give it a name, uh, some description, some motivation, some personality, and start from there. So how can you create those personas? Identify people that are using your app and try to cluster them. Try to cluster them groups together and give each cluster just a different name. So it's much easier to print them, put them on the table when you're discussing which features you're going to take and which you don't take. Um, so that's important. Where do you get inspiration? You can talk to stakeholders. You can um, check your customer support emails. Um, you can listen on social media. These are all tips. You can even do market studies if you don't know or want to have a more elaborate um, view on who is using your product. But it's very important that you start there. Don't start with, oh, BigQuery is a very nice technology, let's go all there. But th because then you're, you're looking at the problem like this, you want to widen your view. So for example, personas here, we have, of course, the casual supporters, the fanatic, uh, fanatic supporters, but also the youth, the people that are playing football, the sponsors, something I didn't think of myself before was, for example, the soccer mom or soccer dad. Very important that they are also with you in your vision. They are using your products because if they will not drive anymore to the, to the practice, then nobody can play soccer. So this is something, somebody that was interacting with the program that I didn't think of before. So it's very important to start with a, a description of all of them, or at least try to be as complete as possible. Okay, so now you know who is using the product, then we go to the goals. Um, what do they want to achieve? How do they want to see your platform um, in five years, in 10 years? Try to imagine it, put, them, put yourself in their shoes and um, try to see how can this person feel very, very good about my, uh, my, um, my application and not just once come back, but keep on coming back. Okay, so we have the personas, we know their goals, then it's time to make the user stories. Um, so user stories go a bit, a bit like this, as a, and then you fill in the persona, I want some goal, so that's some reason. And try to map them out first, uh, and think also in, uh, in, in big terms. Don't think this is not technically possible, this is not doable in the, in the, in the short term, no. Go big, and then you can see where you get but make those uh, user stories so that they're somewhere there. Okay, then next step is try to make a backlog. Try to make and prioritize all the uh, stories you, uh, you defined in the last step um, and prioritize them. Say, this is something so important, we're going to deliver it this year. This is something, okay, a bit less important, maybe a bit more work, we're going to deliver it in two years. Don't say, we're going to do it later, because later in IT means never. You have to prioritize it, you have to say, now I'm going to do it, or in a week I'm going to do it, uh, and make this like stack of, of, of IDs. At the bottom, if you know this is a lot of work and not very valuable for your users, okay, you don't have to spend time on it, on digging what are the details, and the more you go on top, the um, more details you have to gather to see how much work it actually is. And if you have this list, then you can start thinking, okay, which technology I'm going to use, because then you at least know where you're going. And otherwise, you're just spending time on technology, um, and then it's very easy to get stuck. So spend your time on making this, this deck. Spend your time on making this, this feature that you want, and then let Google help you just clicking the things together to get it uh, set up very easy. Because you want to get business value as soon as possible. You want to get your whole uh, company with a data mindset. So everybody knows what the value is of clean data. If not everybody is on the same page, then you will get bad data, people don't care, and then everything just falls apart. So just start with one thing, set it up for one thing, and deliver something. And then you go to the next one, deliver something. Next one, deliver something. Um, so that you don't start with what a lot of customers did. Okay, we're going to grab all our data, 
put it in one place, and then after that we're going to deliver something. Because that phase, the first phase, will never be done. There will always be more data that you can gather. There will always be more data that you can structure. No, do one use case at the same, do one use case at a time. Take a use case, see what data do I need, then go one step back. How can I port it to, for example, BigQuery or to Snowflake or to something else? How can I get it into the cloud? Um, and then try to build that up. You deliver one use case. Okay. So why is this all important? It's important because you have a lot of data. As, as data generators, you have a lot of data that other people don't have. So you can get insights. You can predict the market much better than your competitors. You can predict your market better than the competitors because people that are buying your app maybe interact different with your app than, than somebody else. Maybe you have a lot of people that stopped you eating meat. Maybe a lot of people are vegetarian. And with building those personas, you can see, okay, who is using my, uh, my platform? What do I need to do to make them happy? Another concrete example about the soccer mom that you re uh, remembered from a couple of slides back. If, you, if that's on your list, then you can start thinking, how can I make um, these people happy? How can I make the soccer mom and dad happy? Well, maybe we can start making a carpool service. We know all the data, so we know where they live, probably, or in a region. We know where they're going to, because we know which game they are playing. And we know the address of that club, because we also have that data in the same platform. Because everything is now together, the customer data, and the uh, football club data is not separate anymore. It's together. So we have all the data just laying around. Why not make one UI with a yes or no? Do you want to carpool or not? Um, and so they can carpool. And remembering the last uh, session about the environment, maybe other partners want to come in and say, look, I want to sponsor people. I want to give deals to people that carpool via your app. For example, just saying something Coca-Cola. OK, I want to sponsor the uh, soccer moms and dads. Um, to carpool together to make the environment uh, better um, and not drive with 20 cars to one place, just come by five, it's enough. So try to get with your, um, with your platform, try to predict the wave so you can serve on it. Otherwise, you're behind the wave and then it's hard to time to struggle and that's also the place where a lot of people drown. So thank you for, uh, for listening. Um, we still have seven minutes, so if somebody has a question, Happy to answer. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. You said people were shifting away from CDPs. So do you believe that uh, CDP, like off the shelf CDPs, are, are dead? And if, if not, or if yes, it doesn't really matter. What are the advantages of going full custom versus going for an off the shelf uh, CDP? Okay, so the question, just repeating for the people uh, following the live stream, uh, the question was do you believe there is still a future in CDP? Uh, because a lot of people are shifting to this approach. Um, I think there is still a future for um, off-the-shelf CDP. Why? Because some business just don't have the technological, technological uh, knowledge in-house, so they have to do something. It's better to have this than nothing. But I think for customers that understand the technology and they can build something like this, they will go with this. Maybe they start with a customer data platform, like just, just only this, Maybe they start with the left part, but then um, always remember, I also want to port in more data, not only from customers, but also from football clubs, from other places, from products. Um, and I think a lot of people, if you have the technological experience, maybe you start with CDP, but then you will migrate it to this. So your CDP will become your data warehouse. If that answers your question. Yes, but then you need a very tight integration uh, between CDP and your data warehouse. So you can see your CDP as uh, one of your source applications, but then your data goes from the source to your CDP to your data warehouse, and then from the data warehouse back to the CDP. So it will work. I'm not going to say it will not work. It's just more effort than just porting it to one place. So I'm not saying that this is a bad solution. I'm just saying this solution will get give you more work. Um, OK. Uh, thank you for the question, by the way. Somebody else has a question? Would it just be possible to see the slide on the personas again? Yes. Of 
cars. Uh, this one or this one or uh, this, this one? The one just afterwards. That one and that and the next one, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, that was it for me. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this session. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.